Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here um, and a pleasure to start off this uh, talk. I don't know if the heavy Mayo faculty is referring to the excess adipose tissue. Or... <laughs> so we've broken up these talks into, we're going to talk about valve stenosis in the first talk, and then Dr. Prendergrass is going to talk about the specific interventions for valve disease, and later on I'll talk about regurgitant valve lesions. So we're going to start off this morning. This is actually a, a, a table in the uh, uh, European Society of Cardiology Valvular Heart Disease Guidelines. These are all the questions you need to know in order to properly manage valvular heart disease. We're not going to discuss each of those symptoms or questions during the talk today. I'm going to break it down to be very practical about what you need to know to move a patient forward in their care and the critical decisions that you need to make with them. Let's start off with a couple of questions just to gauge where we're at. This is a 50-year-old man who's active and asymptomatic. A murmur was appreciated on a routine physical examination. Uh, late peaking, 3 over 6 systolic ejection murmur, single S2, 3 plus carotid delays. On his echocardiogram, you can see some of his data there. His ejection fraction is 48%. He's got a bicuspid valve that's calcified. He's got a mean gradient of 42 and a calculated valve area of 1.0. So the question that's going to come up is how do you want to manage this patient? Are we going to do a surgical AVR, a TAVR, take him to the cath lab for hemodynamic assessment, put him on a treadmill, or just observe. Okay, I'm going to give you the answer during the talk, not right now. The next question is a seven-year-old man with class two dyspnea for two years with the same type of physical examination, and his echo numbers are here. His EF is 62%, bicuspid valve, mean gradient of 22, and a valve area of 1.3. Same question, how should we treat this individual? more diversity in answers. Okay, we have work to do. All right, so we're obviously we're talking about aortic stenosis to begin with. Um, I said I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on etiology, but one of the important things here, first of all, we know that degenerative aortic stenosis is the most common cause that we're seeing today, and it's going to continue to increase as our society lives longer and ages longer. But it's also important to know that for patients who are not in the over 60 category. If you have severe aortic stenosis in younger people, you need to be thinking more about these congenital lesions that require more investigation rather than just treating the aortic stenosis. So the bicuspid valve, and we'll talk about that later on, requires uh, evaluation of the aorta and evaluation of the family, for instance. So a 40 to 6 year old with severe AS, think bicuspid aortic valve, because sometimes the echo images aren't always obvious at the beginning. Now, the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis is that this obstruction dramatically increases the afterload in the ventricle. The response of the ventricle to try to normalize that wall stress is to get thicker, decrease it, try to minimize the wall stress, but it also causes a, a mismatch in coronary flow. So you get diastolic dysfunction from the thickened heart muscle and from the afterload mismatch the patients have, and you get ischemia at the subendocardial level. Obviously, those can cause shortness of breath. They can cause anginal symptoms. With aortic stenosis, they are typically predictable. The patient gets the symptoms at the same level of effort on a predictable basis. They can also get syncope, uh, typically due to the obstruction and causing a vasodepressor response. So syncope is a, is a particularly bad sign. If you have an AS patient with syncope, that's probably someone who's going to require an intervention sooner rather than later. Now, this is the natural history that we understand for unoperated aortic stenosis, and you can tell that with an average age of death in the mid-50s, this is a historic uh, cohort. I think we're doing much better now, and your TAVR practices will tell you that most patients are living well beyond their 50s with severe aortic stenosis now. But the point of this curve is that aortic stenosis has a long period where the pathophysiology and hypertrophy are occurring, and the onset of symptoms is really the harbinger of things that are going to bad, be bad happening to this patient. So once symptoms start, the natural history becomes much worse for aortic stenosis patients, and that is an indication to move on to more aggressive therapy and an intervention. <clears throat> 
So the hallmark that we're trying to find in our investigations is identifying a patient who has severe AS, and echocardiography really is the baseline evaluation technique. The 2D features give you the anatomy, the Doppler gives you the physiology. So you obviously want to look at the LV size and function. Those have critical uh, impact on the way we manage patients. The location of the stenosis, valvular, maybe there's a subvalvular ridge of some kind. The rare supravalvular stenosis, typically seen in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, we want to make sure that there isn't other concomitant structural heart disease that would impact the way you would manage a patient. The 2D does not really tell you about the severity of the AS. Historically, people said, well, there's only one leaflet moving, or there's two leaflets moving a little bit. That doesn't really tell us the pathophysiology very well. The Doppler is where the money is. Uh, so really don't use the 2D uh, for that evaluation. We do know that Doppler echocardiography and catheter-derived gradients track very well, so you can rely on the Doppler in most cases to be the assessment of your severity of aortic valve stenosis. Now, Doppler echocardiography cannot overestimate the gradient unless they are severely anemic. And then if you have decreased blood velocity, uh, blood viscosity, the Doppler signal, uh, the 4V squared, doesn't apply. But it can underestimate the gradient if you do not have the adequate angle to evaluate the AS in, in the echo lab. That means they're having to evaluate the aortic stenosis from multiple imaging windows. So remember, in most cases, the gradient you get from Doppler is going to be underestimating or equivalent to the gradient the patient is actually seeing. Aortic valve area in the echo lab, however, is a calculated feature, which means it's prone to errors, particularly the LVOT diameter, which is squared in the formula. So if you make any measurements in measuring your LVOT diameter, you're going to grossly overestimate or alter the uh, aortic valve area. The definition of severe has changed over my career. It used to be 50 uh, millimeters and 0.8 centimeters squared. We're now down to 40 millimeters of mercury for a mean gradient uh, and one centimeter squared for severity of aortic valve stenosis. Very severe is defined by this greater than five meter per second uh, peak velocity across the aortic valve. So how we approach patients is, obviously you're always going to want to take a history and do a physical examination and have an assessment of where you think this patient is at, and you get the echocardiogram as the first clue. If your clinical impression and your echocardiographic impression match, you do not need further hemodynamic testing. You know how to manage that patient based on those numbers. But if your clinical impression and your echocardiogram are at odds with one another, you need to do more evaluation. Now, we've got on this slide here that usually or historically has meant proceeding to invasive evaluation. It's never wrong to necessarily send the patient back for a repeat Doppler study, particularly if you look at the echocardiogram and you see that they didn't do an adequate job of assessing the aortic valve, they didn't do gradients from multiple windows, those types of things. Repeating the Doppler can always be helpful. TEE can be helpful in some patients, although the angles to assess the gradient are often not as readily obtained by transesophageal echo. And CT scanning does have a role. The higher the calcium score, or calcif or higher the calcification of the aortic valve, the more likely it is severe aortic stenosis. But the point here is if your echo impression and your clinical impression match, you don't need to do a additional testing. So we're looking for the severe AS. Occasionally, we get these patients that have low gradient, but also have a severe valve area. That could be to that Doppler angle phenomenon. You couldn't get the right Doppler angle on it. So that might be a case that you would want to consider hemodynamic cath. But there is an algorithm in the guidelines that talk about how you assess these patients that have so-called low flow, low gradient aortic valve stenosis. They break it down based on whether the ejection fraction is normal or abnormal. So for patients who have a normal ejection fraction, there's this, this table which is really nice in the guidelines document. All of these features on this table would favor someone who has severe aortic valve stenosis despite that gradient in the echocardiogram being low. Again, likely indicating that we are underestimating the severity of the gradient by, by echocardiogram. So I'm going to move that over there. For the patient who has low ejection fraction, 
We generally like to do a dobutamine echocardiogram, but you could do a dobutamine hemodynamic cath if that was what uh, you do better in your institution. If on the dobutamine, the aortic valve area increases to greater than one centimeter per second under dobutamine provocation, that is probably someone who does not have severe aortic stenosis and really has myocardial disease and needs to be managed for their uh, left ventricular cardiomyopathy. But if the dobutamine-induced gradient goes to greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, or there is no increase in cardiac output at all, then you're going to use the same table that's here on the right-hand side of the screen to help judge whether the patient is likely to have severe aortic stenosis. So, now that we've got someone with severe aortic stenosis, we want to figure out how we're going to manage patients with symptoms and patients without symptoms. I already indicated on the natural history curve that once symptoms start, the natural history really turns bad. So that really <coughs> is the first indication for operation in AS. If a patient has symptoms that are attributable to the aortic stenosis, so aortic valve intervention uh, is indicated. Also, if they have a need for other cardiac intervention and they have at least moderate AS, if they need bypass grafting, if they need mitral valve operation or something like that, then replacing the aortic valve is also reasonable. The other indication is if the ejection fraction has fallen, if that left ventricle is starting to decompensate because it can't keep up with the afterload insult, then that's another indication for aortic valve intervention. The bigger conundrum comes for patients who are completely asymptomatic and who have a normal ejection fraction. The historic teaching has been the number one cause for death in an asymptomatic patient with severe AS is going to the operating room. But as operative interventions or our non-operative interventions have gotten better, we might be able to change a person's natural history if we figure out the right cues to uh, serve as indicators for operation. So again, if this algorithm plays out, if they have symptoms, we recommend intervention. If they're asymptomatic, we look at their ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction has dropped, that's also an indication for intervention. Historically, we've otherwise observed patients. We do have data, though, that maybe sometimes patients can't detect their symptoms. They are under-reporting their symptoms. And using treadmill exercise testing, historically thought to be contraindicated in aortic stenosis, might actually give you a clue to patients who are uh, having compromised under effort that we can detect otherwise. And here you can look at the dramatic difference in patients who had a positive treadmill exercise test to find it's either very poor performance compared to age-predicted exercise capacity, or their blood pressure drops, or they had ventricular arrhythmias, much worse survival than patients who had a truly normal treadmill exercise test. So if we put that into this algorithm, you can consider operating on people who have poor exercise capacity. The other thing we know is that Severe isn't just severe. There are gradations of severe, and the more severe the aortic stenosis, the worse the long-term outcome. So this is this concept of very severe aortic stenosis, and maybe we should consider operating earlier because operation is almost inevitable in these individuals anyway. So, and if particularly as our procedures get lower and lower procedural mortality rates, why not intervene on someone if the 30-day mortality is only 1% if we know that this is going to be their survival curve if we watch them? So back to this algorithm. For those patients with very severe AS, if you can offer them an intervention with a very low procedural mortality rate and a very high procedural success rate, that's another patient who could consider earlier operation, even if they're asymptomatic. So if we line all these up, these end up being the indications for intervention in patients with severe aortic valve stenosis. Um, symptoms, low EF, poor exercise capacity, or very severe aortic valve stenosis. So what about this patient that we talked about? How should we have managed this individual? He's active and asymptomatic. Uh, most of you uh, voted to do a treadmill exercise test for him. Not altogether unreasonable, but his EF is already low. So this is a patient that we would probably say, let's go ahead and do, offer him an intervention. If he was not sure about that, then offering that treadmill exercise test might be the clinical tiebreaker for him uh, as he's making his decision with you about whether to proceed or not. We'll come back to the fact that he has a bicuspid aortic valve here in a couple of slides. For this 70-year-old man, 
Uh, there was a mixture of responses here. So he's symptomatic. He has a, a, a physical examination consistent with severe AS, but he has an echocardiogram that suggests not severe AS. So this is the case where the clinical impression and the echocardiographic impression don't match one another. So we needed more information in this case. So um, likely a hemodynamic catheterization would be a reasonable way to go in this individual to figure out what's going on down here. Or if he truly does have non-severe AS, what are the other causes for his dyspnea? Now, let's go back to the bicuspid aortic valve. Another important uh, issue to realize in bicuspid aortic valve is the fact that the aorta is often abnormal in patients with bicuspid aortic valve, and so you must address that. Bicuspid aortic valve can also be familial, so it's important that you screen the first-degree relatives for bicuspid aortic valve, and it's important that you look at the aorta. At least at the initial evaluation, you should do one methodology that scans the entire aorta to make sure you're seeing both the ascending and descending uh, aorta. Remember that bicuspid aortic valve is also associated with coarctation of the aorta, which is in part why you want to do that. If your echocardiographic images show you the aortic root and ascending aorta sufficient, and you see that it tracks with the CT or MRA, then you can use echocardiography to follow the aortic root in the future. If they are discrepant, you're going to have to repeat these other imaging modalities in the future. You also need to know indications for, re for operating for aortic root replacement. So if you're going to do AVR because the patient meets one of the other criteria for intervention and their aorta is at least 45 millimeters, you can also replace the root. If the patient has a familial uh, history of aortic dissection or a rapidly growing ascending aorta, you're going to want to intervene on that root regardless, and otherwise if it gets to 5.5 centimeters. <coughs> So these are the pearls for aortic valve stenosis. Remember, the Doppler gradient cannot overestimate it. The valve area can be problematic by echo. Those are the intervention indications uh, as discussed during this talk. Now let's move over to the mitral valve and another question here. Here's a 30-year-old woman who's active and asymptomatic. She has the examination listed there. Her ejection fraction is normal. Her LA is big. She's got a pliable valve with a mean gradient of 5, a calculated valve area of 1.9, and normal uh, tricuspid valve velocities. So how are we going to manage her? Mitral valve replacement, left and right heart cath, balloon valvotomy, or follow-up in one year? Excellent. Okay, so mitral valve stenosis, a little bit different than aortic valve stenosis, obviously. It's usually rheumatic, although that is disappearing uh, in the United States for sure. Uh, but mitral annular calcification is becoming an increasing uh, etiology for mitral valve stenosis. Um, the hallmark, obviously, is increased left atrial pressures and uh, pulmonary congestion. Because the stenotic lesion is before the left ventricle, the left ventricle rarely is impacted by mitral valve stenosis. It is the left atrium and the pulmonary vasculature which are involved. So pulmonary congestion, the left atrial dilatation can cause atrial arrhythmias, and you can get right-sided uh, failure as a consequence of those. Shortness of breath is the uh, most common thing. Hemoptysis is a bad sign in someone with mitral stenosis. It is a disease that has a slowly progressive course. Uh, 10-year plateaus from rheumatic fever to any symptoms, etc. So this is one that progresses more slowly, and because it progresses so slowly, patients may not perceive that they are having effort impact because they get used to their current level of activities and don't understand that they perhaps could expect more from themselves. Same echocardiogram to assess the stenotic lesion. Uh, Doppler, again, is the gold standard. In fact, it's better than cath in most, case, in most cases because we're usually using wedge pressures as a surrogate for left atrial pressure, and that causes some inherent uh, inaccuracies in the true transmitral gradient. So unless you're going to do transeptal and, and direct left atrial measurements, you're not getting a true transmitral gradient, but you are getting that with Doppler echocardiography, <laughs> and you can almost always align that Doppler angle well. So again, the Doppler is not going to overestimate the transmitral gradient. The valve area, uh, slightly more uh, reliable to calculate here. Uh, 
severe uh, mitral uh, uh, stenosis as a grade, uh, valve area of less than uh, 1.5. I generally think of five milligrams and less as being mild, 10 milligrams and more as being uh, severe in terms of a gradient. Remember that this gradient is highly dependent on heart rate. The faster the heart rate, the higher the gradient's gonna be. So at a kind of normal heart rate, severe MS is gonna be patients who have gradients of eight to 10 millimeters of mercury. For a patient who has severe class three symptoms with a mean gradient of six, so this is the case where the clinical impression and the Doppler impression don't look the same, so severe symptoms, but a pretty mild looking mitral valve on Doppler. That's when you wanna, get a, wanna do exercise hemodynamics. So get that patient's heart rate up. On the left-hand side are the resting studies, resting gradient of six, but with exercise, the gradient went up to almost 30 millimeters of mercury, and you can see that the pulmonary pressure is also dramatically increased in this patient. So a patient who has Effort-related symptoms, but pretty mild-looking stenosis at rest, exercise them to match when they get their symptoms and see if the valve is, in fact, functionally severe. So symptoms out of proportion to the echo, get exercise hemodynamics. And remember, if you have a high gradient but the mitral valve area looks mild, often that can be due to mitral regurgitation issues. So that's, that's an indication where you're probably going to want to get a transesophageal study to make sure that there isn't severe MR if you haven't seen it on the transthoracic imaging. We obviously anticoagulate patients with mitral stenosis and AF. This is where warfarin is going to be the indicated agent because this does count as valvular AF. Um, and you're going to treat patients who have advanced symptoms. With mild symptoms, simply slowing the heart rate down can be the most effective therapy. So giving someone who has mild symptoms and mitral stenosis a beta blocker can make them uh, quite content with their symptom status. Um, the first line of therapy, and hopefully Dr. Prendergrass will be talking about this, is to consider whether a valvotomy is indicated in these patients. Um, you're going to want to look for patients who have very pliable valves. Um, and uh, early indications for operation might be pulmonary artery uh, pressures greater than 60, even if the patient doesn't have symptoms, and now even more so uh, new onset of atrial fibrillation. If they have mild symptoms, we're going to observe these individuals, and because the ventricle is unaffected, you can follow them approximately annually. So this woman, what should we do for her? So she's active and asymptomatic. She only has mild stenosis, so there would, there's not a mismatch between her symptoms and her echo. The other thing is, is her physical examination with an S2 to opening snap interval of 100 milliseconds also indicates mild MS on physical examination. If the S2 opening snap interval is closer together, 60 to 80 milliseconds, that's a patient who has more severe MS. So this person acts like mild MS measures like mild MS, so this is an individual that we can observe over time, and 68% of you selected that as part of the question. So, with that, I will conclude, and thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you very much, Steve, for that.